look at the program, uh, we have Mike and Blaine and Greg going to share some information with the highlights of the Research Center's corn and soybean production research from the, this past growing season. Uh, Blaine's going to start us out. Blaine Schatz is the director of the Research Center. Blaine's a native of North Dakota, grew up in the Balfour area. Uh, started here as a, a research tech in 1978. Became a research agronomist at the station here in 1985 and continues to work in the research agronomy area but was appointed director to the station in 1996. So has a very solid background in the agronomy area and definitely has some solid background at the research station here being involved with the research station since, since 1978. I'm going to, uh, as uh, Greg and Mike and I have uh, uh, prepared to present this uh, some production and management information on corn and soybean. I'm going to spend a brief period of that we're all time talking about plant populations. And uh, it's uh, plant populations in corn. Uh, Bruce made reference to uh, some strategies there, some comments related to that. You just heard from the extension staff talking about the issue of spacing and ultimately that does relate to plant population. And uh, plant population research in corn is something that we've actually uh, investigated uh, a number of occasions during this period of time, as Joel has indicated, once been around. We looked at it in the early 1980s. We looked at it again in subsequent years. We have looked at it at our Oaks Irrigation Research Site under the high yield irrigation environment. But it frankly was about uh, at least 10, 12 years that we looked at the issue from a very concentrated effort or more, more concerted effort here uh, specifically at the Carrington Center. Um, and so over the period of time, the as corn in particular, has become a more uh, predominant crop in the region. And as you all become more sophisticated and fine-tuned in your practices of corn production, certainly the issue of plant populations has uh, arisen as uh, a management factor uh, that you have looked to fine-tune and, and modify. And as that has occurred, I found that I felt that we were uh, lacking in terms of some of our up-to-date uh, information. Plant populations are one of our major uh, management factors in, in corn production. Now, depending upon the numbers that you look at, it uh, is a significant input in that it represents about 30, 25 to 30 percent of the direct costs. The direct costs are what you, the producer, or the producers uh, has uh, control over per se. Often, plant populations that we've had in, uh, that are being determined or uh, indicated as optimum certainly have been evolving in recent years. And that evolution is basically that we've seen a trend for plant populations to increase uh, over the years, in particular from that where we started with corn in the 80s, but also even so much as as recently as I would say five to eight years ago, the population trend has definitely been increasing uh, out there. The, the bottom axis there basically shows you some plant populations, and you'll see this, these numbers, these, uh, these increments of plant populations, some of the following slides I'll share with you. But if you were to assume and realizing that corn costs vary significantly with the, 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 the hybrid that you have, the various traits that are associated with it and so forth, but just for purposes of demonstration, if we look at seed, that would be roughly about $250 a bay. You can see that with the population that we're looking at in our, our studies, you can see the significant variance it has on that direct cost that the producer is going to realize. It was no longer than eight, 10 years ago that the uh, net profit for many of our crops in this region, again, eight, 10 years ago, was basically the equivalent of about one and a half increments of change here, about 6,000 plants per acre. That kind of represented what was expected for net income, $18, $20 per acre. So you can see how the plant populations can have a significant influence, and especially if we were to uh, and we're always looking to do things more efficiently, but especially as maybe uh, the production uh, margins and so forth become a little bit more uh, challenging. I think it's certainly a factor that warrants uh, further uh, investigation. And clearly, again, go back to what Bruce had commented that clearly this is an issue that's being looked at by, by uh, both public and private uh, interests. So in 2012, we initiated, once again, some plant population work basically to determine what plant population uh, at the current hybrids that we have would uh, provide us uh, maximum grain yield, optimum uh, economic performance. <coughs> now, 
last year at Prop State here at Carrington, I showed this particular graphic. <clears throat> we'll quickly review it. <clears throat> we had seven plant populations going from 20 to 44,000 plants per acre. And as you recall, as I shared last year, <clears throat> and as this graphic uh, demonstrates, we did not have any significant differences between our 24,000 up to our 40,000 plant population. The low end, the high end was actually <clears throat> significantly less yielding than these other plant populations. We had four hybrids within that trial, as we did uh, in that, which I'll share with you in a moment here, going from a uh, 85 to, or 83 to a 90 day hybrid. But basically the purpose of show, showing this graphic again is to indicate that last year, uh, regardless of the relative maturity of hybrids that we selected, they, t they trended to, to respond in a similar fashion, at least with these four hybrids that we used within this, this study. And again, that was just a snapshot uh, of the hybrids available. And we know that there are different uh, responses amongst these hybrids to plant density uh, influences. 2013, we did the trial again in 2013. Uh, same objectives. The trial was modified just very slightly. Different group of hybrids, but again, we have an 83, an 85, an 87, in a nine-day hybrid. These hybrids were selected basically on two criteria. One is that we saw through various performance tests that they were uh, high-yielding or competitive hybrids within that, their maturity group and uh, that we were able to get adequate seed to, to put into the study. Uh, this year our populations, if you look at them, the seventh populations once again, the increment is just slightly different from the 2012 data. Um, we could not hit the 20s, the 24s and so forth to get the spacing that we desired, so we throttled back 2,000 per uh, uh, plants per increment, but still we had a nice range of 18,000 plants per acre up to 42,000 plants per acre. This is data from 2013, and in these bars here, that represents the average of the four hybrids within each of those populations. The trial is replicated uh, four times. This year, uh, our response was actually even more flat than it was last year. Uh, there was no significant differences amongst the, uh, across the different plant populations we looked at. Again, very different season, late planting. I believe this got in around uh, uh, May 17th or so right in there, uh, as we did not even get into the fields here until May 12th. But again, this is the response that we had this uh, past season. Uh, I have to say, uh, a bit surprising. When you look at the sheer diversity or the, uh, of uh, spacing that that represents from your 18,000, which is just over a plant per foot, all the way up to 42. If you look specifically at the hybrid performance within there, unlike in 2012, we did see uh, uh, more of a spread amongst our hybrids of the, the different relative maturities. Uh, our late hybrid, hybrids in general, that definitely performed, uh, trend performed better than our earlier hybrids. But the bottom line is there was no interaction uh, of hybrid maturity across plant populations. These white bars, old bars, indicate the actual average yield for that particular plant population. As we look at the 2012 and 2013 data uh, representing the plant population work of the, of the recent years at the CREC, I've plotted the data um, in, in this particular fashion to look at it one more time, the initial results. In this case, I've indexed the results based off the percent of the trial uh, high yield. So basically you see here, uh, and again the, uh, the uh, gray bars here, shaded bars represent the 13, 2013 data, the blue bars represent the populations in response in 2012. And in uh, 2012, the high yield was associated, the numerically high yield was associated with the 30,000 plant population, or excuse me, yeah. And this uh, last year, it was the, uh, or the previous year was at 36. But again, with this anomaly that we see right here, 20,000, <coughs> which was last year, uh, significantly lower in terms of the indexed yield, generally we're seeing that most of our plant population that we have evaluated to date during these two years, that we're 95, within 95% 95 of the maximum yield that we had in the, in the trial. Um, other data associated with this trial, uh, again, I don't want to uh, spend much time so as to allow for my colleagues to present, but other factors, harvest moisture, uh, generally was not influenced uh, in, in either of the two years uh, as, uh, you know, due to plant population changes. 
and I actually thought we would see more of it. There was a, a slight numerical uh, differences, but generally that difference was not significant. Whether you're low end or the high end, the harvest moisture was, was very similar. The test weights likely, likewise were very similar. So basically our agronomic traits, especially the significant agronomic traits such as harvest moisture, test weight, and some other factors were not uh, influenced by plant population. So one of the things, was, uh, I guess, uh, maybe in, in conclusion, um, is after two years of study, looking across quite a wide range of po plant population, we are uh, being a bit surprised by the, um, the performance that we've seen across this. It's work that we will continue to do. And again, as we've heard from previous speakers and so forth, uh, as hybrids are designed more specifically to a particular plant population, we certainly need to look at this further to, to fine tune these, these guidelines. But I would go back that if we go back to our work in the uh, previous years at, at NDSU, where we were recommending basically around 26 to 30,000 plants per acre, we're probably not too far off really uh, with the hybrids, at least that we've looked at in these two growing seasons that we've looked at. Uh, from what we have had as a recommendation in those previous years. But more work does need to be done, and we'll do that as we move forward. I guess with that, I'd ask any questions. The question is the population that I showed what was actually was, was dropped or what was actually established. These are established plant populations. And these are, these are populations where there's overplanted, and as soon as possible after initial emergence, as soon as possible, after an initial emergency, we go out there and, and hand thin to get that particular increment of spacing. So those are the final plant populations. <clears throat> these were uh, 30 inch rows? Yes, the, these trials uh, to date have been conducted in 30 inch rows, yes. Okay, as one goes to the, the narrow row spacing, 22s or something like that, what would be the expectation of population response? You know, thinking about crop physiology, one would expect that we might see a greater response or, or needing a higher plant population as one narrows that row to have more equidistant plant spacing to be able to capture the sunlight more efficiently. And so we have not conducted that work. There's been a limited, there has been some work and Greg has done some, some degree of that. Um, we've had some work at Oaks over a few years and in that particular case, it was a slightly higher plant population with the narrow rows, but it was it was was not that much. It was not that responsive when he went to a, 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 I think it was a 22 inch row. But you might say common sense from from a crop physiology perspective, you would think that more equidistant spacing should give us that more uniform or more uh, greater crop response. The question was: there any difference in, in lodging? In 2013, there was absolutely no difference in lodging uh, due to the different plant populations. Uh, in the 2012 trial, the 44 and the 40,000 uh, established plants did have slightly more lodging. I would not call it uh, a deal breaker by any means, but it definitely did. Those populations did have higher, uh, more stock lodging than the populations of, of 36 and, and lower. One thing we saw is maybe you recall those of you who were here last year in 2012. Um, we did see that with the higher plant populations, we had a significant amount of lower canopy firing uh, in August and early September because in 2012 we were quite dry during that time also. But as you saw with the 2012 yields, it did not ultimately uh, have a negative influence on performance. Were the hybrids used flex here? Uh, Dennis, I can't uh, answer that right off the top of my head for the 2013 trial, but I know in 2012, two of them were flex here and two of them were not. I can't say which R M was the flex, but that's what is then as the as the questions brought been brought forward. That's why I feel that we really need to do much more work in this because of the um, in the variances, the inherent variances that are going to be present in some of these hybrids, and so that's why we need to to look at different plant types and so forth too within these investigations. But I would like to think that with what we have provided to date. Um, maybe substantiates or, or at least uh, gives some guidance to the, uh, the reliability that we feel does exist with some of our past recommendations on plant populations. Not to say that we can't fine tune it, but I think at least we, 
we've got a good basis to stand behind some of our previous recommendations.